Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our February webcast. Our topic this month is capturing top stocks in 2017, and we have a very special guest along with us to help us with this daunting task. But first, before we get there, I'd like to introduce our, pro our, our host for today. They are senior product coaches, Arusha Pierce and Scott St. Clair. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hey, Jonathan. Hello, Thanks, Jonathan. Robin. And uh, so I'm very excited to uh, in, have a special guest today. We have David Ryan, a three-time winner of the U.S. Investing Championship uh, back in 1985 and 1987. And uh, he was a client advisor and product developer for William O'Neill for a number of years and then became a portfolio manager for William O'Neill and actually ran the new USA Growth Fund for five years. In 1998, he founded Ryan Capital Management and ran that until 2013. Now, David also has been referenced in the How to Make Money in Stocks book, uh, has a chapter in the Market Wizards book, and the most recent book is Momentum Masters that was released a couple of years ago. So, David, thanks so much for, for being here, and welcome. Well, thank you. It's, it's great to be back. Now, let's just give a, a quick disclosure here for everybody. And also, let's just make sure we uh, get the webinar functionality out of the way. So when you, whenever you have a question, you're going to have a little field that looks like this. Just type in your question, and uh, we will answer it throughout the presentation, okay? And so then here's the agenda. So we're going to go over the current market, and then we'll, uh, we're going to bring David on and, and have David talk about the 1991 Gulf War and, and what he saw back then in the market reaction. It's a, it's a great, great learning lesson. And, uh, and, and David has some really, really uh, cool stories about that. Then we're going to go over 2016 over some of David's uh, trades. And then finally, we're gonna, David's going to cover his research routine on how he finds uh, top stocks. So let's go over the current market. And so here's the NASDAQ. And so you can see here the follow-through day on February 16th, and then you had the, the rally that's been working since the election results. And distribution days of six on the NASDAQ and five on the S&P 500. So David, uh, what, what are your thoughts here? Well, the market, uh, it, it, it just doesn't want to correct. Uh, we got, I love seeing those, if you see the big, huge spike on the, on the day, or I guess the day after the election and the gap up, I usually really key on those points because that tells me that a lot of volume, a lot of money is coming into the market. And, and since then, you know, sometimes these charts are, I don't want to say as easy to read, but, but if you just almost look at the colors and you see the predominance of blue on that chart, you're saying, you got to say that we're still in a, in a nice uptrend. Now, you know, we've gone a long way and maybe, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we did have some kind of pullback or at least consolidation, but you just you got to take it day by day, and you got to look at your individual stocks and see how they're behaving. Let's move on to the S and P 500. And any thoughts here? You know, same thing. Look at the look how it, what's very interesting is how it pulled back right on on top of that 200-day moving average right before the election. Yeah. The other thing that's kind of interesting, I, I see this a lot, is the market tends to move in threes. You like, and I call it three moves down. And you'll see that first move down from down into September. It was uh, at the, the beginning of September. Yeah, th right there, that's, that's one. And then you get the, the next low, you got it uh, 2114, the second. And then you get your third move down. And it's, it seems like sometimes by your third move down, that the the pullback is exhausted and the market's ready to move higher again. And also you can see that sometimes on the on the upside too. Yeah, so, so just to clarify for our viewers, uh, that's from the September to November range right there, those yes. lows of 2119, 2114, and then, can't even see that last one, 20, 2083 right there. Yes. So it kept, kept shaking people out. Yeah, yes. Now, David, I, I know you're really excited about this. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dow 20,000, right? Yeah. Uh, any any marker like that, I really I I almost don't like to see it. I don't like to see when people get so excited about the market. 
Um, and so I, t I take it with a grain of salt. I'm, I'm finally glad it had happened because I, guess I got tired of them talking about it on TV. And, and again, now you have to get back to your individual stocks and what are they doing and, and don't be so concerned with you know, the celebration. And 20,000, I mean, it's a great marker, but um, it's not going to play a big part of my decisions in the market. Okay, so, so that was the current market. We, we didn't want to spend too much time on that because uh, we wanted to get right into the 1991 Gulf War and uh, go, go into what David was seeing then. So uh, I just want to interject real quick, David. Um, I don't want to date myself, but in 1991, I was 21. And, and so for some of the, the, the listeners who maybe don't realize, you know, in history it all seems like, oh, the war was, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, a cakewalk. But at the time, it seemed pretty scary, right? The Iraqi army was the fifth largest in the world. And, and I remember having this fear of being drafted. I mean, it was seems irrational now, but at the time, yeah. there was a lot of fear about this potential war, and you can see the market kind of, you know, anticipating that fear as it starts to head down. Well, it was, it was that, but it was also the threat to the, the oil resources in that area, and Saddam Hussein also used chemical weapons against, the, um, against uh, Iran in previous wars that they've had, so uh, there was a lot of fear that we were going to get into a, in a quicksand and this is going to go on for a long time and, and, and such, and that's why that market sold off so well. The, uh, yeah, you can see the date of when it actually sold off. The other thing that, to point out is just even a few, couple of weeks from before that is that the market tried to go into new high ground, quickly reversed. And when you see that, and you see the, you, there was some pretty big volume spikes during the sell-off and even before that, the, the invasion, that's giving you a clue that, hey, there's starting to be some problems here, and maybe you should cut back, look at your socks, and, and, and just ra raise some cash. So then, as, as the invasion went on, or as, I mean, as, as uh, Iraq was in Kuwait, uh, the market continued to sell off, and again, you can see that the, the actual, the biggest volume started at the beginning of the sell-off. On the beginning of the invasion, you see a gigantic uh, increase in volume. And then when it came down again into later August, that the, the volume was still very high, but it wasn't as high as it was on the, on, the, on the first spike down. And then when you actually came into the lows, you'll see that the volume was actually lower. So you were kind of, you were running out of sellers. And it, 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 it's speaks to your point you made earlier about the market, the three waves down, and yeah. you, you kind of have them here, and, and when you were talking about the volume earlier when we met about this, how, you know, each successive low, the prices are lower, but the volume is yeah. accelerating. So you're, you're running out of people who want to sell. And then what quickly happens, and you'll see how quickly the volume changes, and now the bigger volume that's occurring is occurring on the upside. And you'll see a, a, a lot of very large blue spikes. There's, it looks like there's only one really bad day in there where you had a reversal, and that was still before we were going to get into the war. Um, so, and so yeah, there's your sell-off, all the bar, volume markers. And then I guess, yeah, UN authorizes the use of force. So January 15th was when the deadline was that we, we could actually – and it was a coalition. It wasn't just the United States. It was a number of other countries. And I think everybody was waiting for this invasion to start. And they didn't start it right on that next day or on the 15th or the 16th. I guess it happened on the 17th is when it actually it started. And with such an overwhelming amount of force that, uh, that people thought, oh, gosh, this is probably going to go well and off the market took. I mean, you see the, the follow-through day up 3% on, look at the volume. The volume, is, that looks like the biggest volume that traded almost throughout that entire year and a half on that chart, uh, all to the upside. And that's the power you want to see when, a, when an up move begins. And then here's an example of, um, here's a stock that uh, I know Bill did extremely well off of. But this is a stock that was actually moving into new high ground uh, even before 
even before the market was bottoming. When the market was bottoming, this stock was breaking into new high ground. Yeah. This is These are the types of stocks you want to key off. The next time we get into a, a downtrend and the market looks bad, look for those stocks that are holding up. And the other thing to, to point out is, is actually the relative strength line. It's that blue line below the price line. That relative strength line uh, is is showing you that it's outperforming. Uh, it, it, the, the relative strength line you have to remember is against the S&P 500. The relative strength number is against all stocks. So against the S&P 500, this was dramatically outperforming the rest of the, the and, S&P and so, 500. And, and so back then, this here's the stock that's just kept outperforming during a, a terrible market. Yeah. Kept coming up on the screens, kept coming up in the books back then. Right. Right. Hey, take a look at Amgen. Take a look at Amgen. Yeah. And then so, and then when the weight of the market comes off, and the market actually follows through, this stock is off to the races, and it just takes off and goes. And so this this brings up an important point. I think a lot of people feel like, okay, if the market's in an uptrend, I'm 100% invested. The market's in a correction, I'm 0% invested, and, and that's just not always the case. In this case. Bill was able to identify Amgen as the leader, and we don't have the earnings and sales on the chart, but we've looked back at the model books, and they were massive earnings and sales. So the, the combination of the earnings and sales and the price action of the stock, and he can be positioned in this while the market might not look as good as you'd like, and that's because, you know, using portfolio management, he's not 100%. Right. And so how do you feel about that? Like, if we're in a correction, you know, it's okay to be 5 10 20% invested, you know, trying to get a feel for what the leading stocks are. Yeah, you, you have to, you just have to look through the market and find those stocks that are outperforming. And some of them like this will break out before the market moves. I remember even in 1982, this was before the August of 82 where the market started a you know, 17-year bull market, that a lot of the retailers had, had bottomed out and were actually in uptrends months and months and months before the August 82 bottom. So the leaders will show themselves. And sometimes it's, it's the best time to find leadership is, is what is holding up the best when the market is, is going down. And, and, and I'm saying those stocks that hold up the best that have all the can slim characteristics. Utilities will hold up in a bad market, but you want growth stocks to have big gains. So let, let me set this quote up for you. Uh, I have a, a friend who had been to probably a couple dozen of these workshops, um, and he had taped them all, and then he was uh, nice enough to me to share these with him as he digitized them. But this is a quote I took right from 1991, and, and I played it for David before we came on here, and he could hear where he had talked about, you know, at that moment what the market was like, and he, and he mentioned how he remembered walking into Bill's office. Yeah, I took. I remember just I, tearing them out of uh, out of the books. Uh, some yeah, Microsoft, Costco, Home Depot, Amgen, and and going into them and laying these things down on his desk and saying, I, I just can't. It would it, be hard to believe that the market is going to have a huge drop and these things are going to get destroyed when the bases are so perfect that are setting up. And so that's, that gave us the confidence right when the market started turning higher is to go in there and buy and buy big. So let's take a look at some of those bases. Here's Microsoft back January 17th on that falter day, 1991. Right, and you could see uh, that this, this stock, I mean, a great, beautiful-looking cup and handle, and you can even see it there drawn out in that green line. And here's the stock that came down. And this this is one this one worked a little bit differently in that the volume actually picked up. Uh, you see three very large volume spikes: one in July, one in August, and then one in October. And uh, the volume actually got bigger. And that that last volume sometimes when you see that is kind of the washout. Everybody saying, "I've held on, I've held on, I've held on. I can't I can't take it anymore." And then they all just throw their stock in, and you get that big volume. Right after that, look what happened. You got, you got about six straight days in a row of that stock going up. You're talking about that volume marker that you yeah. – Yeah. that was something that you mentioned that we really liked and we're interested in how sometimes in the middle or near the lows of the base, you can get these unusual volume days where it kind of signifies – you're not looking to buy it, obviously, that, that you know, oh, okay, this is a washout low, but when you're evaluating the stock, you mentioned that you look for these types of days. Yeah, I, I look for, I, I tend to look for those stocks that have, 
that have had the biggest volume in in many many months, and uh, and and this one had it. And there's here's the weekly picture of, of Microsoft, and you can actually see that the huge volume we didn't highlight it, but a huge volume in at the end of September, yeah. uh, September October. Yet in at the end of September, uh, a huge volume spike in in blue, and that. Is bigger than look that than, than almost anything has traded in the last year, maybe even farther back. And then beautiful cup and handle, and the stock breaks out and breaks out what on huge on huge volume. Okay, and and then you also have that three weeks tight there. You know, it runs up this yeah. huge amount, and no one wants to sell. Yeah, you, you can see it. The three week tight. If, if you look at the volume during those three weeks, very very small, very light volume before the stock moves higher. Now here's a Home Depot, and once again, it's it's right there. Built that big cup with handle. Why don't you go a little bit more into this? One? Yeah, and this, and you can see it can. It looks like the washout volume right there at the bottom. Looks like the largest volume that that ever traded in that stock up to that point. And uh, and right after that, just look at the colors. Look at the 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 big blue. Uh, days that are traded there, almost all the all the days that have big volume are on to the upside as that stock is moving up. You know, it all comes down to supply and demand, and that's what you're seeing when you're looking at the volume and, and the volume in relation to what the price is doing. Now, one thing here, David, that was interesting that is the descending trend line, that early entry, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think a, a lot of people feel, oh, I've got to buy the new high. Well, if you if if you if you're buying a cup and handle, you can buy as it's breaking the downtrend in the handle. And you still have, you know, there's a number of days that were even higher than that. I usually look at the base and I say, okay, where is 90 to 95% of the base built under? What price is that? And when I see it's under a certain price and it goes through that, usually that's where I start a position. Now, I might not buy the whole position right there. I'll buy maybe half the position. And then if it starts working out, then another quarter, and then another quarter a, a day or two later if it follows through. So let's take a quick look on the weekly. You can see just a beautiful couple of the hand RS line hitting a new high. And let's go to one more stock here. Here's Costco. Costco, the same thing. Uh, and this, this is a, not as classic as some of the other ones. Um, it came down, you can see actually three lows again where it hits, it hits once, it hits twice, and then the last bottom is, is in October. And then it, it moves up pretty quickly. The, and here's the, it actually built a handle a little bit lower and then actually broke out. And then I guess, you know, this was a still, you can see why it's choppy because everybody's scared and they're not ready to buy yet. And so then once we once the war starts or we get involved in the war, then the thing just takes off. It's already and doesn't look past the look back. Yeah, the the other thing I think we highlighted, which is good, is you'll see the insider buying there right down at the lows. I rarely put any weight there. You can see the insider selling the the zeros with the little line through it. Um, that's insider selling, and I I put very little weight in insider selling because it could be for a number of different reasons. The CEO wants to just for financial reasons get some money out of the out of the company. Maybe he's got his whole everything his life savings wrapped up in a company and maybe he's putting somebody through college or buying a house or something. But I put a lot more weight in that insider buying because they can't sell they can't turn around and sell too quickly. And that's just telling you they have a vote of confidence down at that point. A uh, quick look on the, the weekly chart. Once again, you're seeing this common theme here, RS line new high, stocks uh, well ahead of the market. Now let's just take a uh, one year later how these stocks uh, did. And, and we'll just uh, go, by, go through this pretty quickly here. But there goes the S&P 500. It's up 28% from the fall today. So incredibly important to act around that fall today, to have that watch is prepared and ready. Amgen, what can you say about this one? Up 250%. Yeah, and then, yeah, Microsoft chart is one you should just print out and, and <laughs> put it on your wall because yeah. you, get, you don't get too many cups and handles that look as good as that. That's, that's the textbook uh, pattern right there.
and there's Home Depot very you know similar to to that. And then finally Costco right here. Right, same thing. I think the the, the thing to learn from all these examples is that. First, you key off the, the, the stocks that are holding up the best in a market correction. And you, you buy, you can even buy them or at least start your positions even before the market follows through. If these things have just perfect, uh, perfect bases and are breaking out and have all this handsome characteristics. The other thing to take away from this is the preponderance of how many days in a row these stocks are up when they break out. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them, it's, it's like seven days in a row, up day after day after day. And that's, that's not the, as Bill would always say, your Aunt, Aunt Susie down the street. <laughs> that would be a large institution, a hedge fund, a bank, somebody who is buying a million shares and has to be in there day after day after day. And that's, that's what causes that those, those number of days up in a row. Okay, so let's go into uh, some of the recent trades here. So the first one that we're going to talk about is Sky West, and this is uh, something that David got into. So just to set it up, this was the S&P at this point, right, in November. A lot of uncertainty who's going to win the election, and you, of course, had the results. Market moves up strongly, and uh, this is how Sky West looked. Yeah, and it almost formed uh i mean it, yeah well it was a, a cup and handle the handle a little bit a little bit higher not not perfect but look at the relative strength line going into new high ground as the market is coming off it had all the characteristics or it had all the the earnings and the sales increases and then it and now I'll also look at the volume there's there's really very little selling during that that whole period as that stock is setting up and then it falls through on some very very nice volume so you mentioned the RS line, David. Is that you might not remember, but that's how you would find a stock like this: screening for relative strength line, new high. Yeah, I, it, there's a number of different screens that you can use. I try to go through as many as many charts as I possibly can, but this is that's one one way to one find way. this. And we'll, this, we'll uh, go through that later. We'll jump and show some of David's favorite screens and some of the things that, that he likes. To right, do. and and really around this time, the Sky West was showing up on the Market Smith RS. RS line new high screen that we already have built in in the, the Grill 250. And then you can see the stock already in a nice uptrend. You know, sometimes you don't have to, you don't have to be so smart and try to figure out what's what's gonna what's gonna move. A lot. I, I used to say this in the past, and I think it's still true. I, you let the market show you what are the strongest stocks. Maybe you miss their first move, but if they're great stocks, they're they're going to make more than a 50% move. They're going to have another move, and you get about you get along that next move. And so I, I I think I used to say I would just let the market show me which stocks could double in price, and I'd get the next double. It's funny, Dave. You you stole my line because I was going to say that you've said that before at a number of seminars, and I have it on tape okay. to prove it. That you used to say I like to buy stocks that have doubled. Right. And it kind of takes the audience a, a gas. And when I say that, and then I would tell him, well, he's not buying them after they've doubled. He's seen a stock has shown unusual strength. It's doubled. It's built a base. And yeah. then he's waiting for that. Yeah, yeah, you have to wait for that next base yeah. to form. Uh, and, and you just let it sit up. You have to be patient. Sometimes I track stock for, stocks for months before I actually buy them because I'm just waiting for that pattern to set up to where the risk to me is at, at, at its lowest. And so, yeah, you can see the stock made a nice, uh, it was like a 20%, a, a 20% 20 plus move where I then close this position out. Um, but uh, no, the, the great thing about this, and this, these are the stocks that I like the best, are the ones that break out and they are up days in a row. Not this one day, I get, I get so upset of a, when I buy a stock and it's a one-day breakout, and then it just come, pulls right back into the base. That tells you there's no institutional sponsorship, at least at that point. Sometimes they break out, they come back down on the base, and then they start moving. But uh, the ones that get day after day is showing you large institutional buying. I mean, re really, the best stocks you just give you that one chance to get into it, and then you know, and then gone off and they go. Winning, right? right, yeah. And then here it is on the weekly uh, where David closed his position. And you can see the nice long base that stock came out of. I mean, this, this, this stock had a, it looks like a t uh, three or four year base before it really started making its move. 
Okay, so let's let's go to uh, Ali, uh, Ali's Bargain Outlet, uh, a recent IPO from last year. And and so we're going back a little bit more in time, S&P uh, 500. And uh, there's the the fall through day here. So so remember remember this time. And this is back in February. Markets are all right at the the lows. But as David was saying, a lot of times the best stocks are going to reveal themselves because they're resisting the downtrend the best. And this uh, it, there you got a, a nice cup and handle on that stock. Um, and and you can uh, you know I, I initiated the position I guess on this day when it was breaking a majority of that downtrend, and the volume you can see is is picking up. And so it was a it was a nice a nice buy to get into. Uh, had all the canceling characteristics, and it's, it's starting to follow through. And, and now this one, it, it, it kept coming up on the, the MarketSmith IPO screen, too. Uh, I, a number of us were actually in this, too. So it was it was very cool to see David mark, mark this one up. It was like, wow, you know, this is exactly where a number of us were buying it, too. Okay. Um, we, we keep getting better and better at this. But, uh, yeah, that it was called that IPO screen. A lot of this best merchandise is going to keep coming up, and that's why we have a specific screen just to highlight uh, what's the new merchandise coming up. And I, and I think the O'Neill and Company has done studies in the years past saying that a majority of the greatest winners come out of IPOs that are IPOs within the last, I guess it's three to five years. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, one thing, one last thing to mention about this. Stock came out, and it came out, I think they've, they, it, was, it, it was a bad market that where this stock actually IPO'd. And I actually like IPOs that come out in bad markets because it's usually better merchandise. When IPOs come out, stocks come out, and it's a super hot market, the investment bankers are just scouring the country, finding anything they can get out and push out there for merchandise. This, this came out in a tough market. It pulled back, set up a whole new base. And, some, and these are usually the stocks. They're the IPOs that really are successful and take so off. You passed on Pets.com, then I'm guessing. Yeah, that back, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, you want to talk about a perfect cup with handle? There it is. Yeah, there you you got it right there. And then and then maybe also um, we can get into the, the story a little bit because that's that's a, another kind of leg in the stool of building a position. You talked about. You know, buying Ollie, it's, you know, obviously we, we look at technicals, we look at the earnings, and we like the moons to be aligned, but you mentioned the, the story, you knew the story really well, which we, we really thought was interesting. Yeah, this, um, the great thing about the internet now is that you can, you can get access to so much great information, and, uh, and I started listening to their conference calls, and one little fact that stood out in my mind about this company was that they had not closed a store in 30 years. This is not a new company. I mean, this has been around for a while. I mean, they're on the East Coast. I had never been to one until I went. To, I saw one in uh, October, and um, and so they had never closed a store. So they're that's telling you that they know what they're doing, and they only have 200. They have 200 stores now, and I think they're going to keep on building them out. So it sounds like they've got good management, and and this is something that you know. I, this is almost going back to pick and save when Bill made a fortune off of pick and save. You know, this might be the next pick and save. I don't know. We'll we'll, we'll see as as time goes on. But it's that same type of same type of market. It's not exact. It's not like a Dollar General. It's it's not like a Dollar Tree. They don't have any perishable fruit and vegetables and milk and things like that. A lot of more expensive items, and um, it, when I was in there, I was fairly impressed with the, and how they were doing. So this is this is a quote from the, the CD, how to, how when to buy stocks. It's kind of an interview with uh, David and Bill together. Um, probably came out in what maybe the mid '90s, I would guess. It's one of the first things. I when did. I first started to you know get into the system and learned about it, I, they had sent me. A cassette tape, and if you don't know what a cassette tape is, that's what the internet is for, right? <laughs> you can look it up, you know. And, um, but uh, then they got a CD, and so you can listen on CD. But uh, this is a great interview, and it, it's funny how the reason I like this quote is 
kind of the core principles of CanSlim. The market seems to change a little bit. It seems that the market's a lot faster nowadays than it used to be. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. But the, the core principles of, of the system kind of stay the same through, throughout the years. Yeah, I, I don't – yeah, maybe things move a little bit faster, but if you just step back and – you don't get caught up in the the intraday noise and programs and algorithmic trading, uh, but you look at the big picture and give these things room, especially when you've got a nice little profit. Then you can you can trade around your position and try to hold them for the long term. Because uh, I mean, I, I, when I've watched Bill, uh, he made his move, he made his money in stocks that he held a year and a half, not not a week and a half. He wouldn't be in and out and in and out and out. He would find that he would take the, the 7,000 stocks and narrow it down to one stock and really concentrate in that one, maybe even two stocks. But uh, he was, you know, he was able to take that much risk. But uh, and and a lot of people can't can't do that. Uh, you kind of have to find your own personality in the market and where you're comfortable. Uh, maybe for other people, for individual investors, it's. It's it's ten stocks and ten percent in each stock, or uh, or you know I think when I was doing my best it would be four or five stocks and a you know thirty or forty percent of my money would be in one stock. So um, you have to find your your comfort zone. But a lot of these principles they don't they really don't change. So here's yeah so there, here here's where I reduced the position. I got a really nice move. I mean that's that's almost a uh, a thirty three percent move in a matter of like four or five weeks. And then it had a, a, a large reversal, and that's where I said, okay, well, maybe now I'll cut the position. But it reduced the position, so as it corrected, I wouldn't be as, there wouldn't be as much pressure to, to, to sell everything out because I've already taken profits. Yeah, and, and I remember when we saw this initially, we were both you know, you know we're a little surprised that, wow, you, you had a, held the position through that, and that goes back to that conviction, the larger story. Yeah, you, you just you have to, to to be able to hold something for a longer term. You have to know the company because I'm telling you, it doesn't matter how good that stock is. Sooner or later, the chart's going to look bad, and you're going to go on. Oh my gosh, I got to sell this whole thing out. Well, maybe you just hold on to a partial, you know, a, just a little bit of that position even when it's looking horrible, but if you know that the fundamentals are really good and they're really in the right area. And so that's what kept me in this stock. Yes, I mean, I went through, I mean, that's like six or seven months, right. eight months of it just going sideways. The interesting thing, too, is is that it pulled right back down onto where it, where it, and I first initiated the position. It got support there, moved back to the highs, and started consolidating and getting tighter and tighter, and then then it moved out, and I started uh, buying more of it or adding back my position. This is from that same same CD where you talk about that it builds a new base, and then you just either add back the position, and maybe in your you know earlier days you might have been more aggressive buying even more. You know. Yeah, you you can if a stock sets up a whole new base and the characteristics are still there. I mean, you can you can you can buy even a bigger position if you've got the capital. That's where that's where you make really really big money if you take you take a position and the stock makes a, a nice move. Maybe you sell some out, build a whole new base, you buy back your position and even more. And sometimes you get some of these growth stocks that have multiple moves over in a year and a half, and you get a number of bases, and that position can get bigger and bigger. But I, I caution you on one thing: is that 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 big position should not be a big position until you've already made some money in the stock. I would never, I'd never, I don't think I ever saw Bill, and I've never done it where I, I say, oh, that's the number one stock. It's coming out of this new base, and everything goes into it. I would only build a position or get it to a substantial size after I've already had profits in that stock. And there's, yeah, I guess, yeah, there's, look at that nice, nice base, and you see how it's getting tighter and tighter, relative strength line going into new, into new high ground. And, and that's where it's at right now as of last week. Yeah, and, yeah, and I was just going to say the, uh, what it did is, 
it, it broke out and it pulled back again. It pulled back down on the previous yeah, base, yeah. and now it's up. It's actually up a little bit, uh, a little bit higher this week. And so it's, you know, it's it's not a Nvidia. It's uh, it's it's not one of these rocket ships, but. It's nice to have a slow and steady stock maybe sure. in your portfolio then then some of these things are just all over the place uh, and retail is not doing well I mean the retail has been one of the worst groups and maybe if they swing back to retail this might be a leader okay and so now one more stock now now to set this one up because this was probably the most interesting one now once again this is back in February you have that undercut and the market looks terrible at, at this point. Yeah, one thing on this, I, I like, when you look at this market chart, I'm constantly looking at undercuts mm -hmm. because yeah, I always want to see what is the market doing when either it's making a new high or making a new low because sometimes in those positions it's a shakeout and you can see what happened here and this was in January. You, you came out, you came below two prior lows but you quickly reversed. If it stayed below those lows, then the market was going to probably go lower. But the fact that we came down on one, and one day we reversed dramatically and then it started moving back up, that told me, hey, maybe the correction is over and it's time to go back up. Now, there weren't that many stocks that were breaking out. And, the, and, um, and oh, this, is, this is a picture of the gold mining group. Now, I, I, I've done well in gold in the past. And one thing I'd say about you know, gold stocks and even some biotech stocks is that they're not going to have canceling characteristics. Biotech stocks sometimes, yes, as they go, as they get approvals and they start making money. But there is a, there is a portion of my portfolio where I will buy cyclical stocks or turnaround situations that don't quite have the earnings yet but maybe have a perfect base. And I'll do that with maybe 20% of my money. The other 80%, I'm going to be buying can slim growth stocks because there are, there are going to be markets and uh, 2009 was a great example where there were no growth stocks that were anywhere near their highs. Everything had been beaten up and destroyed. And so you're sitting around, if you're just buying strictly can slim stocks, you'd have to wait for about three or four months. But there were some stocks at those times that had some, you know, some cyclicals, some turnarounds that were starting to move out. So, that is a category that I, I think about 20% of my money. But you don't want to get too much of that in, in, your, in your portfolio. But that adds flexibility, though, right? A so little bit of flexibility. Market, right? Yeah, and um, you know, a little bit of a balance, too. And so then this came up on, on your screen, a relative strength new high screen in, in MarketSmith and the top industry group screen. Too. Yeah, you, you might think, oh, my gosh, this is actual... I mean, if, if Bill was in here, he'd probably slapping my hand with a ruler or something. Because he's going, oh, my God, a $4 stock. It's way below 10 It's got none of my characteristics. You know, I'd probably be kicked out of here. But there, is, there are some times where you, can, where you can break some rules, but you do it with a very small amount of money that starts working up, and you add to it. This stock actually had a move from you know two to three and a half, and then built a base for almost a year, and then built this pretty steep cup and handle. But look at all the buying. I mean, look at the blue down at the down in the right hand corner, as the stock before the stock broke out. But as it broke out and went to new high ground, the volume just increased dramatically, showing you a lot of people were buying and moving into these types of stocks because these had been down, gold had been down for about three years plus. And then there's, yeah, there's the picture. See, this stock, this is, again, there's a stock that had already made a move, built a whole new base, and I was buying it coming out of that, that second base. And if you might say, you might say, well, well gosh, look at all that, uh, that overhead supply. Well, that overhead supply starting at, at four, three, and four was, was actually three years ago. And so those people have either been worn out or they've passed away and they no longer have a position. From the stock, stock maybe. Oh, well, yeah, maybe the stock put them to an early, early grave or so. But, so that's why you go and kind of go, okay, that overhead supply is probably not going to have much of an effect. And especially when you get, you get the volume like you did, the weekly volume. And you, look, look at the volume on this whole, the, the last 18 months there. 
most of it is all is, is blue. Anything that's red is is below average uh, average weekly volume. And then, so look at the stock made a, a great move, move to uh, you know move from three and a half to five and a half, pulled back, built a small little base. And then added, I added to the position as it was coming up. And so it's already made a, a really big move here. Yeah, and so that's giving more confidence to add to the position here. Because yeah. at this point, it's like, wow, I've already had made a big move. Do I want to reduce? You almost think. But you're, the market's telling you, and you're, you're right at this point. Let's push it a little bit more. And right. That's what you're thinking about. Okay. Yeah, because I've, I've already made. I mean, it's not a double, but it's I guess 70 percent on my money. Builds, a, builds a new base. Gets a couple days of. Of, of down volume, uh, but then starts back up yeah. with some very, very strong volume. And yeah, you can see the, where the position was initiated, added to the position, then it just kept on going. And, and you can see sometimes you don't, you don't want to get too smart. You can actually say, well, look, I'm just going to use the 50-day moving average as, as a stop point. And that's that's what I did. Even though I lost that that last point and a half, um, I still got a great move out of that stock. I mean, that was at least a, a you know 250 percent move, and and so it, it it was moving right along that red line, which is the um, is which is the 50-day moving average. And then look at the giant volume that came in. Look, that that's the biggest weekly volume. That's what I call volume markers, the largest weekly volume that traded in the history of that, as far as we can see. And, the, yeah. The, the weekly with the support that you talked about, and, and especially in the 10-week, it held that line, you know, it looks like three or four times before it finally came yes. out. Yeah, and, and, um, yeah, and so, but when I see the volume like that, that, that really picked up, then um, that's when I say it's, it's, time to reduce the position or, or come out of it entirely. Okay, so now let's go into your research routine, uh, how, how, what you do to find these uh, top stocks here. And so let's go over the, the first one here, your high composite screen. Now, this is a run on MarketSmith. You're creating the screen on MarketSmith looking for a composite rating of 95 or better. Yeah, these are the composite rating is just a compilation of, of a lot of the different uh, ratings that they have on MarketSmith. And I have found and I've, I've heard and seen studies that the high composite ratings produce some of the best performing stocks. And so this is just, this is just one stream that I run. And you'll, a lot of the streams that I run will have overlaps. I'll find them in, 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 um, in a lot of di the same names in a lot of different screens because they have a lot of same characteristics. The one thing I think people have to be careful of is, and I, you know, working here for 17 years, I saw everybody always try to, to write the perfect screen. There is no perfect screen <laughs> because I mean, I've, I've seen guys, institutional salesmen who had years of experience, they would do this whole thing. And it always misses stocks. Everybody wants that those five stocks I buy and then I go retire. It doesn't happen. I, yeah, I, I run a number of different screens and I see the overlap in names. There's a similar 85, 85, uh, EPS greater than 85, showing you that earnings are strong, relative strength greater than 85. And a lot of the high composite stocks would probably be found in that 85, 85. Big volume movers, yeah, trading unusual volume for the day. Um, I wish they would add a screen that we can see the, can you do that with volume on the weekly? No, just the price change. Just the, yeah, that would okay. be, the volume percent change is not there. Yeah, because it, yeah, it would be nice to see a huge weekly volume. Maybe if everybody gets together, we can get them to for yeah, sure. Throw, yeah, throw, throw that yeah, in there. Yeah, we a headlock after <laughs> here. Yeah. the product I'm, development. I'm all, all about getting weekly yeah. volume percent change. I love that. Now tight week closes. We we have a we have a list within the growth 250, which was, it was pretty cool that that you were looking at that year, looking for the tight week. Yeah, that's I think something that Market Smith added a few years ago, and I, I always like to see stocks. When I'm looking at a chart, I'm really I'm focusing in on those last three or four weeks. Is the stock near a high? Is it consolidating? Is it is it tightening up? And tight weekly closes can sometimes find those stocks for me. And then on the you know on the short side, uh, you know 
I, I got to tell you, 99% of my money has always been on made on the long side, but from, uh, from time to time when, when the market looks like it's rolling over, I'll run a short screen and I'll look for stocks that have started to roll over. Stocks that are maybe now had a big move or living below their 250, sorry, 200 uh, day moving average, and then maybe have a rally back up to that line. This will help me find those, those stocks. So oh, okay, so yeah, no, the, you you mentioned earlier you 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 said something that I thought was very interesting about you know running the perfect screen. So that kind of goes to here. This is a screen that you gave us, a custom screen you built, and you know okay, so why don't I just look at these 34 stocks? You know what, what's the I think there's an added value of looking at a lot of stocks. I know you've mentioned it. Um, earlier when you, you called one day and said, I want to look at more than one stock on the screen, right? Why? Because I want to look at a lot of stocks to get that kind of feel for the market, right? right? Yeah, when, when Market Smith was a printed product, I used to go through every chart, and so I could see a few thousand stocks, and I get a great feel for the whole market and where all the different players are. When you run screens and you're looking at it online, it's, it's hard to go through hundreds and hundreds of stocks quickly on, on online. So, uh, but when this is this is one screen that I ran, that very, very similar to the other ones we talked about, but these are some of the strongest stocks with a lot of the canceling characteristics that, that brings it down to 34. But I, I, it's, it's not enough just to watch, to look at 34 stocks. I wanna see hundreds of stocks. I wanna see different groups, because then I'll, I'll be able to see you know, groups and stocks that are starting to turn early, even before they they hit these screens. I, you know, so I'll, I'll, I try to run other screens and and I go through strongest groups. There's a number of other things I try to do, but the more stocks you can see, the better. Now, w one way that I I accomplish this is this uh, the Mark Smith Growth 250 because it has that wide net. You're talking about like getting a good feel for the market. This is grabbing a lot of the strongest stocks in all the industry groups and really putting it into one list. So here you're running, take that O'Neill database, you're running 30 different screens, and we're just putting it into one list. And so if you want to get a good feel for a market, this is a good start. And then you can keep building up, and then you, then you can be like David and then look at a lot of different other lists too. But I've found from experience, this really covers at least 90% of the stocks that I would want to see. Yeah, and and these these 250. When I when I bring up this growth 250, I usually sort it by a, a group rank. So I want to see the strongest stocks first, or the strongest groups first, the strongest stocks within the strongest groups, and then I work my way down. Now here are the some of the 30 screens right here. So it gets very very specific. Uh, actually, a lot of these screens are built on our institutional platform. So we run them there and put them into MarketSmith. So we're able to code it a little bit better there. But here's just a sample of all these different types of uh, screens we run. Mike Webster uh, built this uh, a number of years ago. <clears throat> and then here's just a, a sample of it. You have the larger list. And then, of course, you can break it down. If you don't have as much time, you can break it down into the uh, – let me switch that back. What happened there? Okay. Nope, I'm in the wrong one. Okay, here we go. Uh, you can break it down in those target lists. So remember, we mentioned RS line new high, RS line new high throughout this whole presentation. You can go there every day and see what stocks in the growth 250 are having a relative strength line of hitting a new high. And, and quickly, we're sure the growth 250 is is named that, but it's a moving target, so we we allow it to to ebb and flow based on the market action. So if there's more names, we'll give you more ideas. It's really an idea generator. It can be as many as 300, as little as 100. If the market was poor, it would pull back on the names. But you can see on this screenshot, 251. It's almost always around 250, give or take. It's kind of the target number. Yeah, and I also look right below the circle of Marcus Smith 250. They have the pattern recognition, which can also save you time during, during the market itself so let's see what, what stocks are breaking out. Now, it's done by the computer, so it's not always perfect. They're not always perfect breakouts, and the charts are absolutely just right, but it, it at least gives you something to take a, take a look at to find hey, maybe something that you missed. And, and I, now, one thing that I remember when I got started out 
it is, in the beginning, you have to learn how the bases look. And usually once I heard about a breakout, it was already too late at that point, right? It was probably like three, day three or four, you know, they kept buying it up and out. So that near pivot, that's where you're going to really start getting that edge. You'll be able to see the stocks as you're building bases. Remember David talked about how uh, he would watch stocks for months building bases and stuff like that. Now you can just go to that near pivot and then just see the stocks uh, before they're, they're breaking out and, and do your research then. So this is, a, this is one of those stocks that was highlighted right from the near pivot. So you kind of get an idea on how it works. It's the algorithm's going to find the base. If it's in the pattern, I'm sorry, in the Growth 250 report, it will dump it into the near pivot list. In this case, if the stock is within 5%. And so it's just, again, an idea generator. Now you can go in and say, okay, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor is building this flat base. What are the earnings and sales like? What's the group like, et cetera? And make a decision from there. All right, before we move on to questions and answers, I know there's a lot of questions from our audience. We do have a special offer available to all of our viewers. If you want to take advantage of this powerful platform that helped David Ryan find many of his biggest winners, now is your chance. We're offering you a four-week trial for just $29.95. Along with that, you get our best-selling book, 24 Essential Lessons, a Lessons for Investment Success. And this is honestly one of my favorite books. I know you were saying earlier, Arusha. Yeah, I, actually, this was the first book I read. This changed my life right here. I remember when I subscribed to IBD, it was, it was essentially a computer readout at that point. But they sent this book, and I, I read it, and it, I had never heard his stock analysis and, and market analysis described in that way. It actually made sense to me. And I read the whole book that, that night. And so it really did change my life. This is a great, great way to start. It's a very easy read, and you really will get the larger concepts down just by reading this book. Now, with the twenty nine ninety five, you also get the Go two fifty they were talking about. That's going to narrow down those choices and give you the two hundred and fifty best stocks of the market based on all of our screening criteria for you to look at, and of course the pattern recognition. So, as opposed to identifying the pattern yourself, we're going to do that work for you. So, for twenty nine ninety five. You get an amazing book, which will help you get started. The Grow 250, which will give you uh, 250 stocks off the bat to find. Pattern recognition to find the right stocks. And probably most important, product coaching. This is a huge benefit of the product. Arusha and Scott are some of our, our, two of our best product coaches, and you get to talk to people like them day one. They're going to walk you through how to use this powerful platform and find winning stocks and hopefully be as successful as David Ryan was. Also, if you're a current member of Marcus Smith and you want to, to uh, step up to the premium, which allows you to have the Grow 250 and the, um, the, the, pattern the pattern recognition also as well, that is available as well. So you want to call 1-800-831-2525. You want to go back for a second? Go back one slide. So the URL is investors.com slash MS2017. This will be active for a couple of days if you want to take advantage of this offer. And if you have any questions, uh, we have agents available now, 800-831-2525, or the link, investors.com slash MS2017. Let's open up to questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, it's, it, we, it's disappointed. We, we, we could have gone with some of the other stories. We have, <laughs> we have more time. We, we have we're so worried about the time, and now we're sitting here, and we have it, we, 55 minutes in, so we, we, we have, have the 87 crash stories. We have the bill stories. Oh, yeah. we're, we might, we're, we'll, have, we'll have to bring David back. For, this for, was for our, our trick to get David to come back exactly. for number two. <laughs> no, um, I guess what we, I would love to start with, we were talking to you earlier uh, before we came on about you know your best advice you know, uh, what you would, you know, always tell people when they first start out or, you know, what are, what are some of the learning experiences that you value the most? Yeah, I, I think if there's one thing I can leave with any of, with you is that, is that you have to really learn from your own investing, learn from your mistakes. Market Smith and Investors Business Weekly, they lay it out there for you. They have got so much material to learn from. And once you learn the concepts, once you learn can slim and the breakout points and such, then it's really on your own to take it and 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 really and run with it. And, and the way you do that is by studying your mistakes. It, study study your winners. Study your mistakes because you can you'll learn more from 
from doing like a post analysis of a stock that you bought. And I, what I do is I screenshot the, the stocks that I buy and I put them in a folder and then I go back after I sell them and, and I go through them and I see, okay, what did I, where did I go right or where did I go wrong in here? This you'll learn more about yourself, more about the markets than you know, almost, almost anything. I mean, some people have asked me, okay, you know, can I just sit next to you and show you what to, you know, can, can you show me what to do? You know, I can do that, but you've got to internalize this stuff yourself, and you, because only you know why you bought at a certain point on a certain day, and you've got to learn from that. And if you can do that, you'll start cutting out your mistakes, and then you'll have a lot more success in the market. And that's, that's what turned around in my, my performance. I mean, when I started at O'Neill in 82, I doubled my money uh, from 82 till the middle of 83. I lost it all back and more. And I finally got so disgusted, I sat down over a weekend and I went through all the stocks that I would bought and lost money and made money on And I studied and I found that I was buying extended stocks. So I just got extremely disciplined. I said, I am only buying at this exact setup, and that's when my performance really started taking off because I, I, became, I, I became disciplined because I was so upset, and I learned what I was doing wrong. If I hadn't spent the time to study mistakes, I wouldn't have, I, I wouldn't have learned where I was going wrong. So it's, it's the most important thing you, you can do as you're, as you're investing, and you, you do it constantly. Every quarter, every half a year, every year, go back and look. Now, now going off that learning, before we started, uh, David, you were talking about all the, the videos that we have and, and the webinars and stuff yeah. like that. You, you, want, you want to talk about that? Because you did make a really good point there. Well, the, I, you know, from what I've seen, you've got hundreds of videos and learning materials and the books. You study this stuff, you listen to this stuff, watch it over and over again. Uh, look at the greatest winners. I know that you guys have got books on the, the greatest winners each year. Get some of those and study those. And just spend time looking. You, what you really want to get in, in your mind is you want to get that picture of the most successful stocks of all time. What did they look like when they broke out? What did they look like during the middle of the move? What did they look like at the top? And what did they look like as they were rolling over? You want those? You want that ingrained in your mind. It's almost unfair. Back back when you started with with, with uh, O'Neill and Company, there was not this many these many tools to help you out. So now what we're offering these days, you know, the Grow 250 and and the pattern recognition, it's almost a, a huge leg up from what you had to work with. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, in in up until the internet, people had to go to these workshops we gave and. Um, and they just didn't have the access to the material that everybody has now with it, it, in your own home by clicking the clicking the, the screen. Got any questions? Just got you any any other questions here? Or do you want to go? Yeah, well, well, let's see if we can grab some that some some of these people have, have talked about. I guess you know what I would um, you know ask that's interesting to me as well is you know the the market is seems different. You know now with the volatility we've talked about, how do you how do you factor that into your decision making, if at all? Well, it, you just have to be careful of the intraday noise. One rule I have, and every time I break it, I lose money, is I don't buy the first 30 minutes of the day. I can't tell you how many stocks. I don't know what who it is or what's doing <laughs> or the computer that you know some of these things they just they're up a point and a half, and you think this is it. It's, they're going. They're going. And um, and you know within 45 minutes this thing you're back down you're down a point and a half you're you're going I'm a, what an idiot so I I usually try to sit on my hands and not go in the direction market sometimes I'll fade the if if the market is up I might sell into into it if it's a stock's extended or if it's a stock I'm looking to buy or I have a position I might add to it if if it pulls down for a few points on no news or so so. There is more volatility, but you have to step back and and uh, and and go a little slower. Speaking of volatility, Brian Brian's asking a question here. How do you position your stocks ahead of earnings? How do you handle earnings seasons uh, these days? You know, they're so volatile, up or down. There, it's it's tough. I, but I would I would I would say that from my experience, stocks with these these characteristics, 
usually end up beating earnings or have a fairly good result as the earnings are, are, are uh, reported. I know some people that they will hold through every earnings report, and sometimes it pays off. Sometimes you get in a bad streak and you have three that blow up on you. Yeah. Um, so some, what I do sometimes, if a stock is very extended from a base, I might I cut back on the position going into earnings. Uh, if it's not too far in the base, and but the stock is performing well, it's got uh, all the characteristics, then I might run through it. A, a lot of it, is, it's almost like a stock-by-stock a stock basis. But if it has all the characteristics, I do not want to lose the whole position. I want to at least maintain something in there. Okay, so you might lighten up a little bit right. and, and stuff like that. Okay, that does so, work. So. Yeah, earnings are tough. I always tell everybody that, you know, if you're ever going to have a big winner, if you're going to have something go up 50, 70, 150 percent like some of the ones we've shown, right. you're going to have to sit through some earnings. You right. can't sell them before earnings and buy them back after because, you know, like the the biggest winner from last year that you mentioned, um, it, uh, it had gapped up on earnings three times. Yeah, and there's some stocks, I think it's stamps.com, that stock only moves on earnings. <laughs> oh, I know, yeah. It does nothing <laughs> the other you know, two months and, and 29 days, but it just gaps up on earnings. So it's earnings. all about position sizing. It, 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 position sizing, and you, know, you, you can maybe hedge a little bit, buying some options, but you, you still, you'll still get hit. You'll lose some money on those options if the stock makes a nice move. Okay, our, our friend Logan here asks, uh, do you do most of your research on the story before or after you purchase the stock? That's a really good question. Well, it, you know, it, it, I like to do a lot of my research on, on weekends before the market opens. I get my list of names going, and I might look into the stocks at that time. Sometimes I will, I will come upon a, a stock that I just didn't see, and it's got everything. I will go ahead and buy a position in that stock if it has all the characteristics uh, but then I will quickly go to the internet site. I'll try to find any research I can on, on the company to then give me more confidence and maybe build out that position. But I would say a lot, a lot of the times it's before the, before I buy the stock. I think it. Uh, maybe I'm misquoting him, but I think I've heard George Soros say like a shoot first, investigate later, or right, something. Yeah, yeah. And that works even even better. And you know, if something's coming apart and you're not certain why. You know, just move to the sidelines, protect yourself, and then, you know, figure out the why afterwards, yeah, on the, especially on the downside. I hate to bring this party to a close, but it is uh, two minutes after five. A lot of people have been asking, will this be archived? Absolutely. In about 24 hours, it will be available uh, on Investors.com for everyone to view. I recommend you watch it a couple times. I've been with the company 20 years. I have learned four or five new things and took a lot of notes. It was a very valuable webinar, so please uh, watch it again and enjoy it. And David, thank you so much for taking the time and coming in. Yeah, okay, thank you. It was fun.